Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. It's Stefan Swanepoel here today. And Jack, are you with us from Austin? I'm here, Stefan. Excellent. And it is, uh, let me see, it is Friday, April the 24th. And this is our fourth or fifth Friday Sci-Fi Chat. We're glad to have with us today, Glenn, Glenn Sanford. Are you with us in today as well? I am. And where do you find yourself today, Glenn? Uh, I am at home like everybody else. Uh, no, I'm in the Pacific Northwest, north of Seattle, um, uh, just south of the Canadian border in Blaine, Washington. And that is what you have always referred to as the EXP World Corporate Head Office, right? <laughs> there you go. It was, it was above my casita, in, or above my garage, but uh, I've now moved it to the uh, second uh, living room because nobody's staying in the condo next door. Well, uh, can, let me just, uh, let's start off by firstly saying thank you very, very much for being with us today. Uh, before we give you some compliments, which I'd like to give you, uh, are you and your family and your loved ones and anybody around you and team members which you are aware of uh, healthy and all going well? Yeah, uh, everybody's, everybody's healthy. We've had a couple um, little, little scares, I think, like everybody has, you know, where somebody's had uh, a little bit of the, the virus and has recovered. Fortunately, everybody I've, I've connected with has, uh, has recovered, but, uh, uh, but otherwise, everybody's good. So that, uh, it's, I'm really thankful, obviously, for that. Jack, maybe we should say that uh, we think that T3 can actually categorically say that EXP is the company that actually perfected and implemented social distancing first, right? Yeah, they we, were, you guys were early on social distancing. Yeah. <laughs> very early. They, un they understood what that meant and they implemented it very, very well. We've known Glenn for a long time. I'm not quite sure how long, but I'm going to call it at probably roughly about a decade. Uh, that we've known Glenn uh, in his activities and early days of, of EXP. And on behalf of T3, I would like to say congratulations, Glenn. A job well done, well done. When we completed the 2019 uh, statistics for holding companies, single brokerage companies, franchisors, which we recently published, uh, not only are you in the top 10 for a company that is less than 10 years old, uh, only second to Compass, you and Compass grew respectively about 80 to 100% in the last 12 months. Uh, Compass, of course, did that through some uh, key acquisitions, and you did it almost exclusively organically, which is an incredibly, incredibly impressive number to do that. When you only have one or two agents to grow with 80%, that's not too big of a deal, but you only have to double in size. But when you already have 10,000 or 12,000 or 15,000 agents, and you then still double again in size, and you jump to, I think you are, where are you now, 26, 27? How many agents do you have now? Uh, yeah, we're actually over 28,000 agents 28, and brokers now. 28,000. 28,000. I remember when you and I set a goal for yourself, which was about, what, eight, nine years ago, we said, wouldn't it be magical if you could ever get to 20,000 by 2020, right? Yeah, I think actually, I think we were actually thinking 10,000 was a, was a, was 10, a reasonable goal. <laughs> well, you blew past that. Incredible. And clearly there's no end. Uh, let's jump into it. Jack, have you got any uh, thoughts that you'd like to share with us before we start giving uh, some questions to Glenn or just some general chat? Well, I just, I just want to say it's been great to watch the, the, your career because we met, you were, you were an agent running a team years and years and years ago when we first met. So yeah. I, I brag on you a lot. I'm like, this is, this is a, you know, proof of the American dream that a, a guy with a big idea can take it big. So just wanted to say that, but no, Stefan, why don't we just dive right into the questions we've got planned and the conversation I'm, I'm, planned? I'm going to give a newsflash first. I was reading the news this morning and I thought I would, we were, we're on a zoom call today. So let me just quickly, I'm going to read off some notes. I took off from the news this morning that zoom, the company, which uh, is the parent company for the, the, the service we are on today got included into the NASDAQ 100 index today. Their stock is up 132% in the last basically 90 days. So roughly, roughly the beginning of the year, roughly the time that, that COVID started, 132% just this year. Their market cap is now at around about 47 billion. And normally last year, at the end of last year, at their high point, they were doing about 10 million Zoom calls a day. 10 million, right? A million six zeros. So 10 million seven zeros. They now this week are averaging 300 million Zoom meetings, 300 a day. Incredible. So there's a company that has benefited from Zoom. 
Uh, so despite all of the bad news, uh, we see that the deaths in the US today are up to around about 50,000, and we are rapidly approaching the 200,000 number worldwide, which of course, very sad, and we, we have our best wishes and condolences and prayers that go out to anybody that may have been affected directly or indirectly as a result of Zoom. No pandemic, no virus, no crisis, no depression is ever good news. But, but we're here not to talk about it again. We all, we all see the news more than enough, and it's one of the stations which I can't stay on for more than 30 seconds. I like to look at what's happening and then get off it. So we're not talking about COVID today. Let's talk about our industry, and let's talk about EXP. And Glenn, just in general, your thoughts about the industry. Are there any kinds of companies that you think are going to be benefited or will have a, a beneficial impact as a result of, of uh, COVID, or maybe do you think are going to struggle as a result of COVID? Yeah, so, well, I think actually, after all the, uh, all the juggling takes place, I actually think everybody's going to benefit from COVID. Uh, and, and, and I truly believe that uh, because I think what a lot of people are, are realizing very quickly is that you don't need all the bricks and mortar to ultimately continue to run an enterprise. And, and so if we sort of think about that at, on, at a, uh, further out, that means that a lot of you know companies that currently you know, do have a lot of bricks and mortar are going to either downsize, eliminate, or figure out other ways to engage with you know either agents, brokers, and staff. And it could be also settlement service providers. It could be any number of these different different uh, service offerings. And and if you can get rid of the single uh, biggest cost to running an enterprise, which typically is your bricks and mortar, followed quickly by your staffing costs, then all of a sudden you've got a def different economic footprint in order to operate your enterprise. So right now it's a little painful because you still, you know, a lot of people still have their physical bricks and mortar uh, leases and, you know, maybe they got some, some bailout money uh, or, or some support money from the government to kind of get through this. Uh, obviously most companies didn't, but if you, if, you know, assuming that you make it through it, then, you know, you get to the other side of this. I think the, the, the reality is that everybody's going to benefit from thinking about, you know, the fact that we can now can operate fully, you know, virtual or at least partially virtual as an organization. We don't need the physical infrastructure that we've invested so heavily in for the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years in, in, in organized real estate. And I, I know listeners, some of you might be thinking that Glenn is saying that because he's trying to promote EXP, but I don't believe that that's true. We, we, we said this even last week when Robert Refkin was on the call and the week before when Jack and I was talking, it, it's, COVID isn't helping necessarily EXP. COVID isn't necessarily helping DocuSign. EXP isn't, oh, sorry, not EXP. COVID isn't creating uh, online software or creating new models. COVID is accelerating the use of good technology. We were using good technology before. We were already on a trend where less office space was appropriate. The Keller Williams model has less office space than the Century 21 model. So every time we reinvent the industry, we do enhance our use of technology and we decrease many of our fixed expenses. We think, I believe Jack and Jack, please chip in in a second, but we believe that activities like 9-11 or Katrina or COVID accelerate those trends. They don't create the trend. The trend was already there. So, so EXP was riding a trend towards more virtual activity, towards more cloud-based technology. And what COVID is doing is it's proving out the model works. It's proving that you can actually do that. And I think it's happening faster. So DocuSign, I think, will get more usage as a result of, of, of COVID. It didn't create DocuSign. It's just going to prove out that it works. Jack, how do you feel? Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. If you look at the average square foot per agent in the industry, the trends have been on a downward, they've been on a steeply downward angle for quite some time anyway. Mm -hmm. even, even people that still had bricks and mortar were allocating less and less and less space per square foot. You know, it was 120 you know, square feet per agent and then 190 and 75 and 50 and 40. So that's been happening and people have moved to kind of a coffee shop or a meeting space sort of uh, model instead of everyone having private offices or there being, uh, you know, areas that agents have seats reserved. So I think that's been the trend anyway. And I think it's absolutely right that this just shows that where we were headed, we're just going to get too quicker. And I think the other piece is um, it, it's really, if you've had people that were resisting learning the technology, now they've had both the time and the reasons to, to get in there and get it figured out. And, and we've heard that from other leaders we've talked to is that, 
you know, their managers are now taking the time to get into the tools. Their agents are taking time to get into the tools. Uh, and that's one of my questions for you, Glenn. What have you seen as far as, have, have you seen it impact the usage of the tools and systems? Because I know agents that join EXP are a little oriented that way to begin with, but what, what sort of impacts have you seen as far as usage and adoption? Yeah, uh, well, you know, obviously we've, we op we've operated really quite in contrast to the rest of the industry. We've operated entirely cloud-based and virtual since we, we started. Uh, but what we've seen is one of the products that we, we, we had available to our agents um, for probably the last year or two is their ability to actually have what we refer to as their own private office suite in our, on our campus. And, and uh, you know, a lot of agents were still, they managed their own physical offices potentially outside. They might have been running teams or what have you outside of, of, uh, of EXP. So they would sort of quasi have a physical space. But we've seen a ton of uptick in actually agents setting up their own suites and actually putting a receptionist at the front desk and allowing customers to come in and organize uh, conversations around the real estate transaction in a virtual setting, um, which is something we didn't see prior to COVID. No, so they were somewhat resistant to this technology mm -hmm. because, you know, they're, they were operating like a lot of people, which was uh, they, they were out where the houses and the people were. And right now you can't get out to where the houses and the people are as easily. So they're like, how do we set something up that makes us accessible to other teammates, to other people in the organization and, and potentially our, our end customers. Uh, Jack, jumping up on, on something you had said where we were already on that downward trend. I remember one of the reports, and I don't have it in front of me, but at one stage, maybe about, what was it, about two decades ago, we said that the average space per agent was around about 120. And then we had seen that some of the new companies coming out with initiatives at the turn of the century were talking about 80 square feet per agent, per, you know, per agent. So there was already pushing down on the 120. And then another, another decade went past, and, and after the depression of, of the uh, sort of 08, 09, people which were redesigning offices were saying, well, even 80 is too much. Maybe we should be looking at a, at a 30 or a 40 feet per square agent or per, per agent. And then, and then the, the flat fee companies came out and the fixed fee companies came out and companies like HomeSmart and Realty One and United. And they all said, well, we can fit in, you know, maybe a couple of hundred agents into a couple of square feet. So they said, we could maybe go down to 10 or five and then I remember EXP came out and said, well, we'll just go down to zero. So, so of course, the zero is an extreme, and I'm, I'm sure not every company is geared to go to zero. So whether you believe it should be five or 10 or 15 or 20 or zero, we all know that the 120, of course, was the old paradigm. The, let's call it the, the more traditional paradigm. And the absolute virtual model is zero. So somewhere in between there, if you pressure down, you can remove some of the expenses in your business. And that's one of the things that you and Dean spoke about on Tactical Tuesday. Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. So yeah, I, th I just think that, that, that it's, it's also a lifestyle trend. I mean, I think people don't want to drive into an office. I think mm. they don't want to get in their car. Um, you know, they, they, and especially part of the reason why people go into real estate anyway is to have the freedom to have a flexible schedule and work when they want to work from where they want to work. So I think that's very appealing. It's part of why people want this kind of a career. Uh, and so this just fits with that. I mean, it just, in terms of, of you know, having a, a lighter office that maybe you just use for meetings uh, or, or moving totally virtual or just meeting with your clients, you know, wherever they want to meet. You meet with them at their home, right? So I uh, think here, it, it's changed uh, it. So here's a tricky question for Glenn then. Many of the traditional companies uh, which had offices and did lots of things offline have now moved to an online a Zoom environment or they're having daily meetings online in the morning or they're doing virtual hugs or whatever the good stuff is. You were already doing all of that. You were doing that even prior. So, so what kind of things is an online company like you now adding to your already very uh, online kind of offering? Yeah, no, it's interesting. You know, early on you asked, you know, who, who potentially gets impacted. Uh, and to some extent, you know, I see us almost being, I, I don't want to say negatively impacted because I don't think that's true, but I, I see more competition in, 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 in real estate brokerages actually operating and sort of getting the economic benefits of operating more remotely. And that's been one of our sort of uh, uh, 
you know, we've been uh, well defended that people didn't want to take those risks. The established companies mm -hmm. didn't want to go there in the past. So I think that that's, uh, but we're, we're uh, obviously we, we, I guess we'll say pioneered uh, a fully remote organization in, in real estate, at least in, in a way that actually scaled. And, uh, and so we're always looking at, you know, how do we create more engaging places for people to work online? And so whether it be our, our virtual campus, uh, EXP World, uh, we, we actually bought, as you know, Verbella back in 2018, uh, which is, you know, really it's the, the premier virtual world for business platform that's out there. And even inside of that, they're already working on disrupting themselves with web-based virtual offices uh, that are free to use that will support up to 20 people uh, and, and webcam and screen shares and all the sort of tool sets that sort of go along with that. And so I, I just see that there's going to be a lot of other things that are come, going to come along that are going to be, again, somewhat disruptive to even the way that we've operated in the past because all this technology gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Uh, and, and, and companies will just naturally adopt, especially in the current environment, some of these and at least try them out at a very minimum. And, and our agents are doing the same thing. I mean, they're using, they're doing more of the, vert, the 360 uh, tours where they're actually co-browsing a 360 walkthrough of a home uh, with a client. And, and that, so they're going through as effectively an avatar in a 360. And in some cases, the, the clients themselves are actually doing the 360 tours from, the, from their homes to actually get them set up because you know, agents either can't go out to the house to actually take the photos or what have you. Uh, so we're seeing you know, the agents and, um, and customers collaborating in ways they haven't collaborated in the past as well. So we've, we've literally taken full listings with all the photos uh, without visiting the home because the customer and the agents have been collaborating uh, and so the, the agent hasn't went to the house, hasn't taken the photos, and yet it's got listed and in some cases uh, has sold already without the agent actually going into the home. So that's kind of a different, mm. different thing that's going on as well. Jack and I have so much fun when we have strategy days in our offices. We do that. We try and do that once a quarter where we try to allocate the time, if we can find the time, just to brainstorm and strategize and, and, and think of the industry. And at one discussion, I remember we were saying how, let's say, I'm just using as an example, when we did some research on the, on the history of the industry and the evolution, we said, look how maybe Keller, which was created in the 80s, basically became a newer model to, let's say, try and disintermediate to some extent or evolve or pass, let's say, the old ERA or the old Century 21 model and come up with what they believed at the time was a new model. And they said, we're disrupting the traditional industry and here we are. And for a period of time, Keller was absolutely the, the, you know, the hottest flavor of the day. And then, and then you came along and then you said, well, I'm going to create a model which is even different and better than that one. And I'm going to be the disruptor of Keller Williams. And you started disrupting Keller Williams. And now you're saying, well, there might even be more companies that are coming, which is going to disrupt EXP, right? And so every, every 10 or 15 years, there seems to be a big push towards innovating what was the innovator before a decade and a half ago. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and I think that's the, uh, you know, I've been an entrepreneur since I was, we, we like, we tall. And, and, uh, and I think that's the one thing I've always enjoyed is trying to figure out what the next disruption is and being on the front of that. So I, I, was, in, I, I was building online services in the, in the late 80s, early 90s and worked for AOL at one point um, and built one of the largest online services in Western Canada. And then I got disrupted by the web. And then I got, went into web design and then built an e-commerce logistics company right at the uh, dot-com collapse, which was unfortunate timing. And, and then, uh, you know, real estate, it's, been a, it's a really cool industry because it's literally, in my opinion, one of the, if, you're, if, you're, if you look at it it's sort of from a future state and you sort of figure out what does it look like 10 years from now and you start building all that infrastructure today, you got a chance of actually you know, hitting a home run and, and, and disrupting stuff. But it takes a while. It takes, takes energy. And, and right now with, with what's going on, there's certainly an opportunity for the next disruptor to start to stand up because there's a, it's a, it's going to be a different world post COVID. Mm, mm. Yeah. The tools that, the tools that people have available to now that you, you, you guys had to go figure it out and put it together and spend all this time and energy doing it. And now there's a lot of things off the shelf where, you know, you can say, I want to, you know, I'm going to start a company. We 
we're going to not operate in an office. We're going to be virtual. And we're going to do it all this way. And, you know, you can go sign up for tools like that to support it that it's candidly didn't exist 10 years ago, or we're not mature enough, or, you know, we, they, they, they were harder to use or, you know, for, for whatever reason, they just weren't good enough. So, uh, but those are, I mean, that's not commonplace. So I can see that happening very quickly. Yeah. I mean, you'll look at, look at companies like Lemonade in the, in the insurance space. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you sort of, sort of think about where, you know, what if, you know, the consumer, and I, I certainly, I'm not really interested in disrupting ourselves, but what if there was a, a full on AI engine that worked direct with consumers and got the photos and negotiated the contracts and literally there was no, nobody in between other than dealing with sort of an AI in the middle. I mean, it totally was sort of, I mean, I, I know somebody's working on that project. I don't know who, but it's got it. You know, it's it's pretty. It's it's like one of those ones where you know lots of venture capital will pour into that space to try to figure out how do we create an AI for real estate agents. That sort of answers the question from Nada, which I see is here in the box here. We had said, Glenn, will robots one day become our peers? And you've said, you know, you said maybe to some extent. Yeah. You no. Know, I, well, I do think that you know eventually, and I've talked about this in the past is that eventually you and I will, will have our own personal AIs and, 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 and which will, will be our virtual surrogates to actually you know, have conversations and to act as our digital assistants uh, to, to ultimately schedule stuff and do stuff and potentially you know, write replies back. And I, I, I think instead of it being a corporately provided <clears throat> function, even though I think there's going to be a corporate function, I think that one of the interesting things is, as a, uh, is that we'll, we'll have individually uh, these, these uh, surrogates that are, that are digitally based. Glenn, you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago Verbella, and I also read recently uh, in a press release that you are, of course, still involved with EXP in a very prominent role as chairman of the board, a very important part of the company. So you're still involved, but you're, it would seem a little bit less involved with the day-to-day -day, and that you are now more involved with the subsidiary that you uh, EXP had acquired, which you mentioned Verbella, which was uh, the, black, the platform, the virtual platform. I believe it's an augmented reality, virtual reality kind of a platform. And you recently shared with us the fact that you guys were just involved in a big event in France. Uh, would you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, this week, in fact, it finished up today, uh, Laval, Laval Virtual, um, just finished up a huge event. They had a 20,000 person event that was supposed to take place in France, which was for the XR, which is the augmented reality and VR community, virtual reality community. And they were doing that in, 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 as a physical event that got canceled. They moved it to uh, a Verbella. And so they had 6,000 plus attendees attend over the last three days, literally uh, breakout after breakout after breakout in multiple different spaces in, in their own Laval virtual campus. It's uh, probably, uh, I don't want to say for certain, but I believe it was the largest single asynchronous virtual reality event uh, conference that has taken place to date. Um, and, and so it's, uh, and, and they did it on our, our platform, which is pretty cool because um, we, EXP literally has been using it and pushing the envelope on the Verbella platform over the last uh, four years or so. And because of what we were able to do in terms of building our company, it, it kind of created this conference ready platform. So we've now had Laval, we had uh, Dell was in there this, uh, this last week doing an event. We had, um, we have Deloitte uh, the, uh, in, in UK and Australia uh, in there. We've got a number of other cons large consulting companies. We've got you know, a lot, lot of really well-known enterprises, um, some that were under NDA that have their own private campuses that are, you know, have ten, uh, tens, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of, of employees that are now using the platform. Um, so we've got you know, this huge groundswell. So similar to what you were talking about relative to the, what's going on with Zoom, we went from in, in January um, having maybe 40 or so customers to literally today having you know, plus 400 plus um, customers on the Verbella platform. So we've literally, you know, um, what is that, uh, uh, 10X our, our customer yeah, base. 900%. And, yeah, and, lit and, and on top of that, we've got uh, 
uh, a large number of, uh, of big enterprises that are you know, looking for how do they move their, their virtual headquarters onto the Verbella platform. Yeah, not a shadow of a doubt that the importance of technology, and I think Jack and, and Travis on our team and Michelle on our team and Jonathan and Mark, um, they discovered that as well uh, when they, in the last three months, were busy trying to analyze all of the technology players and vendors and providers in the real estate space. I, I asked Jack so many times, I said, Jack, how many tech vendors are there in real estate? How many tech products are there in real estate? How many apps are there in real estate? And he says, you're, you're asking me for a number I don't know. And I said, well, go find out. And, and he and his team did months of research and they came back and said, well, we can't give you a definitive answer. We still don't really know. But according to our best calculation, it's definitely north of 1,500 and probably around about 2,000 was the number Jack said. He said, if I add up all the products and apps and services, and that's just in our tech space. And I said, well, Jack, are they all good ones? And he said, hell no. Some of them suck. I said, well, how, how does an association or an MLS or a brokerage company, how do you know when something you know, doesn't suck? And he said, well, you, you know, you've got to do all the hard work and heavy lifting. And I said, everybody has to do the same work over and over and over again. I, I don't have time for that. So they, they were trying to come up with just a list. And that's where they came up with the Tech 500, a list of roughly the 500 best in broken into categories. And, and I think tech, I think you're right, Glenn, tech is just becoming more complicated, more robust, more vendors, more players are using it. If, if, you're, if you're 10xing usage of the Rebella platform, just think if other companies are gonna grow at that pace. Think what technology is gonna to do to our industry. What do you think it's gonna to do to our transactions? Well, transactions one, I, I think is still one of the, the, the ones that hasn't been disrupted near enough. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the reality is, is that you know, the, the transaction workflow should be so automated now uh, from the point that an agent you know, uh, you know, turns in a, a transaction to the point that they get, get paid and, and yet, from what I've seen, and, and maybe I haven't looked hard enough, it still seems like it's a very manual process to actually get a transaction from, from contract to close. And uh, so that one there seems to you know, have lots of, lots of places you can really simplify the, the whole closing process. And we've talked to, talked to some folks on, on that, and we, we want to literally you know, help um, you know, someone do that because if they can integrate with all of our systems and they can add the, the, the AI component and the machine learning and the contract reading and the, you know, all of the sort of the broker oversight functions, uh, I think you might have even noted at maybe one of your, your T3 summits the, the idea that, uh, that computers using AI reading contracts, uh, you know, get 97% of the uh, accuracy, whereas individuals uh, reading contracts only get, you know, uh, some subset of that. So, you know, so the more that we can sort of add a technology layer to it, the more likely we're, we're going to reduce our E&O expenses as real estate, you know, brokerages and, and other things. Jack, what do you think uh, could be automated in technology in the next year as a result of maybe uh, the advent of COVID? Well, I think there's already been some work going on right now to automate in areas that are high value for real estate. Uh, there's a lot of work being done looking at the transaction files themselves and using machine learning and optical character recognition and identifying problems with contracts. Uh, because many, you know, most, most contracts uh, follow a certain path and it's, you can train in artificial intelligence to not notice like, oh, there's something different about this contract. There's something different about this agreement and to surface it then to a human who can then intervene where intervention is necessary. So I, that, that's already been, that's been a problem that people have been working on. But I think this, this movement to, you know, to online, this movement to, you know, reducing our footprint um, means that there's going to be more value in those kinds of, uh, those kinds of services. So I think that's an area. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the virtual, um, yeah walkthrough and the 3D technology that we've seen. It's like any technology. We saw, you know, it come in and it was very expensive. You had to have a super expensive camera and we're going through the generations of seeing that get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And now we're at a point where, you know, a consumer can take it themselves. So I think anything that is, is um, labor intensive in our business is a target 
for that kind of automation. And so if you have labor involved and there's a way to automate it and do it through technology, there are, you know, we all used to be terrible photographers, by the way, like myself included, everybody was terrible. And then what happened is the technology kept getting better and better and better. Now you can buy iPhone 10 and you're taking these photos and you're getting these very high quality photos. And now there are online retouching services that were first done by humans, but are now being done by artificial intelligence and machines that saying, hey, we know you want the sky bright and you want the, the, the dark spots brought out. You want this, that, and the other. They're kind of standardizing that. So a lot of that image enhancement that you used to hire, you used to spend a lot of money to hire a good photographer to do all this fancy stuff. Well, now it's in your phone and it's connected to a cloud service, to an AI, to a machine learning algorithm that knows how to enhance a photo. So those kind of very labor intensive things that we, we've done for years and years and years in this business are being, are being automated as, as the machine learning and artificial intelligence tools are getting better and more mature. So that, that, those are the, the, I mean, those are a couple examples. There's a lot of different spaces you can point at where it's like, oh, there's two or three companies that are working on that problem right now. And, you know, not all, they're not all going to get it right, but there's, there's some money and there's some smart people. And they've said, Hey, we're going to solve this one little problem here where, you know, human intervention is required times X transactions times X agents. And that is a lot of savings in terms of time and effort uh, and, and a benefit to the consumer and to the agent who can now handle, you know, more transactions at a higher level of quality with less support services from other people, right? They can just be more self-sufficient, do more transactions. So, so that's, I mean, what do we do with this? What do, what do we do with this beloved industry of ours that sometimes is, may I dare say over the public air, stubborn uh, and fragmented that, that you said that technology, you know, solves the solution and it does. And, and in the case, Glenn has shown that technology allows their company to do things that, that maybe haven't been done before. And, and you've got other examples in your Tech 500, but yet the industry tends to hold back and they just don't want to change. And we're still so slow. You know, some of the things which, which you and Glenn have been referring to today, which I concur with, I, 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 dis I don't disagree, I agree, but we've said some of these things for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. Uh, damn it, when, when, when is it going to happen? Right? When is it going to happen more? That's true. Well, well, yeah, if I can, yeah, if I'll, 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 I think one of the challenges, we, we struggle with this. I mean, obviously, we've grown fairly large in, in t a very short period of time, but, you know, organizations become fairly bureaucratic over time, as much as we try to defend against it. And so the larger, the or, larger organizations have a hard time adapting to change. It's not, I don't think it's that they're fundamentally stubborn. I think there's, there's a... Uh, there's a need just internal to most organizations that this is the way we do it. Uh, that's why I think right now is like this great opportunity to change it up because you just don't have a choice. Um, but, you know, when, when things go back to no, uh, whatever that new normal is, I think, you know, leaders have to figure out how do we shake it up? Because if we don't shake it up, uh, you know, there's going to be, a, there's going to be an up and comer that's going to, is going to take some market share. And, and so, you know, that's probably what I focus more of my time on is how do I keep on shaking things up? And, and uh, fortunately, I, I, take, uh, I take resistance as a challenge to break through. But even inside of our own organization, it's, it's tough sometimes to make changes. So I think it's just fundamental to large organizations that it's hard to change. I think that's a very, very astute observation. Again, just looking back at the, at the, the research which we released a, a couple of weeks ago, the, the, the big companies in our industry, uh, the, the Rilogies, the Berkshires, the Kellers, the Remax, they are all still doing well. They all still have great market share and they are holding, they are just definitely holding their own. But you look at companies like, like the Compasses, yourself, uh, the Redfins, the Knox, the Open Doors, the Offer Pads, and, and you could even into that group, if you want to put younger companies, you could put in the Home Smarts, the Realty Ones, the United, and you, you look at their growth. Now, again, they're, they're growing from a, a lower base. So, again, it's easier to grow a, I don't know, a $1 billion company than it is to grow a you know, $5 or $10 billion company. But you can see the new companies growing at not just a slightly faster pace, but at a very, you were mentioning 10x, but, you know, at a very, very rapid pace. And for the first time, we are seeing on these lists, and again, the list is not about you know, where you're ranked. It doesn't mind whether EXP is fifth or sixth or seventh. It is the fact that EXP wasn't on the list two years ago and is now on the list. 
where, where two years ago it wasn't even big enough, or three years ago it wasn't big enough to be, tr to, be, to be really ranked. And now it's not only ranked, it's not only in the top 100 or top 20, it's already in the top 10. Compass is in the top five. Redfin is in the top 10. EXP is in the top 10. So we now have companies which were not players three, four, five, six years ago. And now they are real players. Redfin and EXP and Compass and, 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 and Nock. These are all companies that are real with whichever number you want to look at, a, a profitability or agent or sales volume or transactions or office count. It doesn't matter. I know everybody likes to slice it differently. But these are really successful, significant companies growing in market share at leaps and bounds. And maybe that's the shift. Maybe that's the change. Well, I just uh, I had a chance to chat with a... Um... Um, a, a gentleman investment banker is working with a professor at Harvard and they're studying virtual organizations. And uh, so they may be writing something up on, on, on what we've done. But one of the things that came out of some of his research was that companies that operate in a, in a totally cloud-based virtual basis, the, the, the ones that make it, uh, the return to the founders and to early on shareholders is about 10 to 40 times the return on investment of the of the bricks and mortar based enterprises. So you know the it, so you know being virtual, being cloud based is right now still it's still the disruptor that I think a lot of people can embrace fairly easily. Um, you know, there's other technology disruptions that you can sort of add to the mix for sure, whether it be AI or whatever. But the one that I think is most accessible is how do you how do you shed most if not all your bricks and mortar footprint and how can you use that as a disruptor or or a innovation that you know drives you know what for most people uh, are looking at how do i build a profitable long-term sustainable enterprise and 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 that so i still think that that's the technology uh facilitates and it enables this this uh this non-bricks and mortar based work which is now a reality Mm -hmm. and, and I want to I just real quickly, I want to defend, and it's maybe a little counterintuitive, but I want to defend the brokers and the agents that maybe aren't leading the charge on a lot of this tech stuff, and now they're being forced to. I mean, I think there's enough uh, people in our industry that have been burned by the latest and greatest thing that came out, or by vendors that didn't keep their promises, or they've invested a lot in something and it didn't work for them. And so I think some of it has been the maturity of some of the technology that's been offered to this industry, the maturity of the vendors in the industry. I mean, this is still, you know, a big technology company in this industry is a $20, $25 million revenue company. But in the Small. world of technology, that's a little yeah. tiny nothing company. I mean, yeah, it's yeah, bite yeah. size. It's bite size. So I, I think that our, our industry um, ha has been burned and, and people in it have been burned. So I think some people are reluctant to this and not. not I mean, we, we do it all the time. We work with companies all the time that are, looking and they're they're with the system because it works it solves the problem today who cares if it's not future forward or sexy they don't want to move off of it because they don't they've been burned before they've tried something out and it didn't work out and it cost them a bunch of time and money so i, I think there's a i think there's a case to be made for that conservatism around your systems at saying as a guy who got off the blackberry a little too late and on the iphone a little after everybody else um but but you know and i'm I, but i'm also i think having the vision of now's the right time to make the investment. I'm going to move forward. It looks like this is a trend. And now we've all been forced to adopt all this stuff. Like that's, that's when you know that it's time to jump up. Well, I think the, the other piece is, is that the reality is that real estate agents also, it's not just the bureaucracy of organizations, real estates themselves did not want change. Right. Um, and so we have to sort of identify that was the elephant in the room for all these broker owners and brokerages is that agents didn't really want to change. They, yeah. They went to this particular office. They had a relationship with the broker owner, the manager of the office. They, they liked uh, the, the, that, that piece of it. And so if, a, if somebody brought in something and said, this is the way we're going to do things here, that disruption would drive away agents. And, and so that right now is, again, one of those things that you don't have to worry about as much because you're having to adopt a whole new technology stack. Whatever that technology stack is and whether you go back to your 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 physical offices, there's a lot of technology that you, if, if you're not introducing those and testing those out right now, you know, shame on you as a. The best research I found, uh, Glenn, to support that thinking that you and Jack have just said is, uh, was a Harvard study uh, of about, I think it was around about 2012, if I remember correctly. And it, it, it fundamentally said 
it's not it's not really just a broker or a realtor a problem of being resisting it's an incumbent philosophy it's the person who currently is in the position of power or control so when you are the existing dominant market share player if you're doing a certain existing paradigm whether you're in the hospitality space or the taxi space or the airline space or whatever space or the real estate space you tend to be a little bit more reluctant and a little bit less inclined to want to change simply because you don't you don't want to change your existing paradigm works and in our industry i think the single biggest dominant factor is because our industry is so fragmented, there are so many agents, 2.5 million uh, licensed people, 1.4 million members of NAR, about 86,000 companies. Because of that fragmentation, there isn't one or two or three people taking a decision. The decision is almost wielded down to the lowest common denominator. So there are millions of people that have to take the decision to want to change. And yes, you're right. In our industry, they don't want to change. Maybe in the hotel industry, they didn't want to change either, but maybe the hotel owner forced the change just a little bit faster. But in the insurance industry or the taxi industry, where that change also went down to the lowest common denominator, meaning the taxi driver, that individual just said, no, uh, I like what I'm doing and I'm making money with what I'm doing. I'm going to stay that way for as long as I can. Because as Jack said, I've been burnt with new technology. We've all been burnt with new technology. Technology as a concept, as a principle, is great, but not every single technology on its own is necessarily a winner, right? There are winners and losers like there are with anything. You know that better than anybody, Jack. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, don't, you, come up, you come up loser sometimes, and you, it's not fun. It's not fun. Not right, I'm going I'm to come back to, to Glenn so you can think about it for a second. Uh, no rush, but uh, I, I, Glennon, a wrap-up answer from you. Um, outside of EXP, what recommendation are you going to give or would you like to give? I'm going to ask Jack to answer it first. What recommendation would you like to leave with the listeners today? What should a broker or an agent or either or both be doing in the next 30, 60, 90, 120 days, in your opinion, to be better prepared for whatever is coming up? So think about that for a second. Jack, and then on your side, I know at least you've given that question some thought. What would your, and no rush, what would your takeaway be to our readers? Yeah, I mean, right now, you know, most, most brokers, most agents are in an environment right now where they're, they're kind of locked up for May, and they're probably not seeing a lot of transactions happening. They maybe rode off of a good March and, and maybe had some of those spill over into April. That's most of the people we're talking to. So, and I said it on last, on the call two weeks ago, you know, preserve cash, make sure you've got cash in the bank. Uh, be, you need to quickly sort your database of the people that, you know, are still, you know, like everybody kind of took a step back when this hit. You got to find the people that are still engaged, still have a reason to transact, to buy or sell, or they have a need to buy or sell. Like you got to sort your database and then you need to stay in touch with everybody really well right now. Um, people value this, the human contact. Uh, they're, they're, they're trapped at home. They're with their kids. They're, 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 they, they want some human contact and maybe not with their coworkers that they're seeing on zoom every day. So, so reach out and be there because the measurement right now is engagement and engagement will lead to sales. And that's, that's what to focus on. And if you're a broker leader, if you're a team leader, you want to support your agents in doing that and in staying in touch, being of service and being ready for when the market turns around because it will. Real estate's a fundamental thing. Like people need to buy or sell, they need to move, they need to change their housing situation. That's not gonna go away after all this is over. It's gonna look different, but it's not gonna go away. My wife loves going to model homes and going to look at the new stuff and the new construction and, and the new ideas. And uh, although we haven't now done it for a while, she actually says she can't wait to get back to do it. And we're not even in the market of buying a house. She just says, I miss going on open houses and tours. I want to see stuff. I want to see people. So I guess we'll do that at some stage in the future. Glenn, what would your, your information be to the group in general? Yeah, so um, one thing we've noticed, um, and of course, we're, we're operating you know, all 50 states and, and, and 400 plus multiple listing services in terms of our service area. Not every market's the same. There are, there are quite a few markets in the country that actually are operating very much like normal, um, where you're not really seeing much impact. So, you know, so I think the, the key is, is that you have to sort of look at where you're at. Obviously, if you're on lockdown, you know, uh, first the thing I say to, every, to, to agents uh, is literally, if you're on lockdown, 
go get your continuing education hours done. So you actually don't have to worry about it the next renewal. Um, you know, that's kind of one of those things that every agent puts off until literally, you know, uh, one, two days before their renewal. And, and then they're having to sort of get it done, you know, at the last minute. So, you know, get that done, you know, clean up your database, look at your tech stack. Um, you know, the, the reality is, is that there's, there's different ways to engage, you know, update your, your, your social media, get more engaged, do more, you know, right. But one thing that I, I, I really think is that there's people are on social media more, both the, on the, the, the viewing side and the, the content side. Obviously, we're, you know, we're on Zoom here and, 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 and people are seeing this. And so there's, there's ability to create, you know, build your audience. I, I started a podcast uh, about two, two and a half weeks ago on working remote and, and already had, you know, a thousand people listen to it. And, and I've been on numerous, you know, Zoom, Zoom meetings and, uh, and, and, and uh, going online, but, you know, create, create your audience. You can, you can build that audience up right now and be of service. Uh, you know, I think that the other piece I always think about is the real estate agent is the ambassador to your local community and neighborhood. And so to the extent that you can be of service uh, and to the extent that you can help out and go grab groceries, go do some things to help other people out, uh, you know, take advantage of the opportunity to build your service oriented brand in your local community, because that will pay dividends, um, you know, when things, uh, you know, turn around. Uh, very, very good advice. You can probably add about uh, 850 people that uh, registered for today's event to your list as well. So there's about 850 people that registered for today's Friday fireside chat. Um, so as we probably have about six states that have recently announced that they're going to gradually start easing back into business, we know that there's a lot of dispute and discussion about when that should happen and when it's too early and when it's too quick and which, which spaces you should do that. And most states are saying that, you know, it should be 14 days of declining uh, illnesses reported before you should even allow a gradual return. Some people are talking about a U shape, some people talking about a V shape. So whether you're in some of the states that might be first, the, the Nevadas, the Georgias, the Carolinas, the Michigans, the Colorados, the, I think Oklahomas, which may be first, and whether it's, whether it's today, Friday, or Monday, or a week or two weeks time from now, I think there is a general building of more positiveness towards the fact that we are most likely going to see a beginning of a return to business sometime during the month of May with June and July, hopefully, hopefully looking a little bit more back to normal. We understand that no normal is going to look like the old normal. As Glenn and, and Jack said, the new normal will be different. But we are very positive that we'll see you all on the other side. So from Glenn, thank you very much for being with us. Jack, again, as always, Friday Fireside Chats. Uh, from me, Stefan, uh, have a wonderful weekend. And we will see you next Friday. In between, uh, you can check out Ask T3 if you want any free consulting, which we are currently offering to anybody uh, as long as the stay-at-home order is still in place. And then Tactical Tuesdays with Dean and any of our consulting teams on Tuesday. Look forward to seeing you next Friday. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.